Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down the movies to look for insights into the movie-making process. Hosted by Goose and Maverick. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Welcome, everybody, to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by Touched with Grapes. From a vineyard in the south of France, try 17-time Emmy Award-winning Gloria Gregson's Touched with Grapes. Welcome, everybody, to The Pestle. I am Wes. And I am Todd. And we are filmmakers, um, actors, writers, a musician, a producer, and me. (laughs) 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 Oh, man. That's too much. Too much, my man. (laughs) So one of the things that I find, I don't know, interesting is, you know, getting to this point, like I've I've been full-time director, writer, filmmaker, whatever, uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and it's been a slow grind, you know, uh, we're in the process of trying to make a movie, any movie almost. Um, and it's, it's hard though, to build a career. It's hard to build, um, something that you enjoy and something that you love and you're excited to do day in and day out. Um, because it's, it's all too easy to kind of get sucked into things that just pay the bills that aren't really progressing and getting you to where you want to go. Um, and for me, I think the, the thing that's helped me to build and kind of get me closer to my end game, right. Of being a, 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 just a director, um, and someone who makes movies and documentaries and all these things. Um, it's, what does that road look like? Right. And I think the things that I settled on very early on, um, was that it kind of all boils down to your reputation and building your reputation. Um, because it's so easy to get sidetracked into these things that you don't really want to be doing. And so I think it was key. The thing, the first thing that I I picked up on was you need to do what you want to be known for. You're going to, you're going to get a reputation one way or another. The only question is, is it the rep that you want or is it the one um, that's going to put you into this bind of this lifestyle that you don't enjoy, this work and um, path that is in the antithesis for what you're wanting to do? Um, like I, this didn't, this transition didn't happen for me overnight um, to be like most of my work right now is writing and directing. Um, and that took, you know, the better part of 10 years. Like I would say it really started, you know, for coming to fruition over the last two, three years. So you're talking about seven, eight years of, you know, a slow grind. Um, and I think some of the keys that go into that are being able to say no, um, uh, creating, first of all, create your own opportunities, right. To show and grow your skills. That's what I mostly focused on early on a lot of free work, um, stuff that, you know, I did with you, you know, to, to try and help, you know, your band at the time, like I saw that as an incredible opportunity um, to show off my skills and challenge myself, grow my skill set, build my portfolio. Um, and so I, every time we we stepped onto a set, I was trying to maximize every opportunity someone gave to me. And that's how I viewed it. It wasn't like, I have to do this thing for Todd. It was Todd's asking me to create something with him. And I am going to do everything in my power to make it amazing, not for me, but for him and for his goals. And, um, and along the way, that's something that I get to show off. Um, and it can benefit us both. Um, and by contrast, I also turned down projects that either didn't fit my portfolio, uh, agenda or the goals, um, that, you know, that I had for me, like that I, I didn't really do wedding videos. I did two of those for very close friends and that was it. I was like, guys, y'all, I don't, I don't do weddings. That's not my thing. And, you know, if you do, if you're out there and you, you do shoot weddings, more power to you. Um, and if you enjoy it, and I've met people who love telling those stories. And that, I think that's the coolest thing in the world. Um, and all the more reason why I should not be doing those things because uh, <laughs> I just wasn't going to enjoy telling someone's story that I didn't know. Um, and, you know, the, the ones that I did... I knew these people, right? And so there was a, a lot of joy that I had and a lot of terror also because the last thing you want to do <laughs> is mess up your friend's wedding video. Um, but I also turned down things that I just didn't connect with personally, right? Like 
I, it was important. It's always been important for me to enjoy what I'm doing. And so unless it's like, and don't get me wrong, there are plenty of projects that I did for money, right? That's part of this process of, uh, building a sustainable, you know, life. Um, but there were other projects that people would approach me with and say, Hey, would you like to do X, Y, or Z? And you know, a lot of music videos, of course, and I would listen to their music and I was like, man, I think what you're doing is great. I'm not emotionally connecting with it. And therefore it's not the right project for me. I could make something for you and probably make it well, but it's more important that I emotionally engage with what it is so that I can do it to the best of my ability, the best of my skill, um, and be excited for you, um, to show it off. And also for me to add it to my port and everything that I create, that's my number one goal. Can I make something that I'm excited to have in my portfolio? And it doesn't always work. Um, but if I only succeed at that, you know, 60% of the time, that's a lot of nice stuff that I can add to my portfolio, um, that will have other people looking at me and wanting to work with me and, you know, level up like, Oh, now you can shoot ads like, Hey, here's 10 grand, go shoot a, a, an ad for me. Um, show a product demonstration, whatever. Uh, and so it's just been this slow, steady thing of, uh, I'm writing constantly and I would try to get people together to make things and, um, soon enough, you know, one person saw my writing and saw my directing and believed in me enough to say, Hey, would you be my creative director? Um, and I, I really like the way you write. I like the way you direct. I just want you focused on that. Let me handle producing. Let me handle selling ourselves. Um, and you can do what you're good at. I will do what I'm good at. And together our powers combined, right? Well, mighty morphin power animal or whatever. Like it's, it's, it's a, it, it's a process and finding the people that, you know, you fit with is really incredibly hard. And so obviously when you run across those people, hold on to them, do whatever it takes, you know, uh, cause that's, that's the, that's the hardest part. Um, yeah. And now I'm still, you know, looking for the next level. And I think I have a lot of those pieces around me and, uh, the ones that I don't, I will sub, you know, do what I can to fill those cracks in until I find those people longer term. Um, and so that's kind of my brief, you know, idea of what it means to get to where you're trying to go, which is mostly focused on building your reputation. And I know that works really well in filmmaking, but I'm curious, Todd, from your perspective, uh, you have far more experience than I do in like music. How do, do you think that works with creating a life, you know, with, as a musician? Um, I mean, much the same way, only, you know, you, you, you know, you don't need as many people. We've talked about this, you know, multiple times on the podcast of, of, you know, I like to compare where possible music with, with film, but in so many ways, they're not exactly the same because, um, to make a good album, if I'm knowledgeable enough, I can just do it by myself. I don't need anybody else. Um, if I'm knowledgeable enough, now that's asking a lot because there are experts at mixing, there are experts at producing. And if you want to do it, you know, like for the most part, you need other people to collaborate with um, in music too. But if you are just a badass, you can do the whole thing by yourself. You can't really do, no matter how good you are at making movies, you can't really do it by yourself unless it's very specific. Unless yeah. it's like, I'm, you know, the, the style is locked off shots. I'm the actor. I've written it like I'm Bo Burnham setting up inside, lighting. right? Where it's just exactly it's me, yeah. and it's yeah, an it, hour it, and a half of me, me, <laughs> me. Um, and and you know that may be good one time, but yeah. you can't really you know make a career on making those kinds of movies. So, um, but you know to to answer your question, which is a a, a good one, yeah, I mean you know throughout my almost 30 year career now, I've met a lot of great producers, a lot of great musicians that I've had play on my albums. My first album was a conglomeration of all the best musicians that I knew at the time. And, um, and I, they all did it for nothing. You know, they all just came in. I said, Hey, I, I have th this, these tracks, I, this is what I'd like done. You know, or could you come in and, and play on it? And they just did it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's great. But then as you go, as you go on and you, you make more and you make more, you know, 
you come across these people like like Matt Noveski, I met in Guitar Center. I just saw him and I was like, I think I know that guy. I think he's in Blue October because uh, I'd seen them several times. And I was about to leave and I went out to my car and then I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back in there. I'm going to talk to him. And I got out of my car. I went back in there and I, and I just said, hey, man, I'm in a band. I know you are. And I, I know who you are and I know the band you're in. And, uh, you know, he would really like your insight into my EP, right? And I, I had an EP at the time. I gave it to him. And then like a month later or something, he, he called me. And then we've been friends ever since. And I'm actually going to be working partially with him on my new album. Um, we just keep talking. It just, we, it, it's like we go away for a while and then we come back. And we're like, hey, this is what I'm working on. You want to you wanna mess around with this? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. I mean, I'm still working on these tracks with with the guys that were in my, that were in my band, you know, the bass player and the guitarist that were in my band, and and um, and the guy who mixed our last album. I'm probably gonna have him mix it, and you know. But also, I know this other band who had this mixer in New York, who I really loved the work that he did on on their album, and so I'm talking to them about maybe talking to him about mixing it. So there's there's a lot of similarities when you're talking about doing it at a level, at a high level, you know, mm. um, what I like to subscribe to is do what you do as best you can and pay someone who knows a wealth of knowledge about something you don't to do that. It will always be better to then, then, kind of like futzing it and and making it up as you go or learning as you go if you want to be high level you know if you want it if you want it to be like a uh no one else could have done this kind of thing you can't do everything you just can't you've got to bring other people in and over the years you know you probably just to your point you probably know so many more people than you really think that can help that know more than you on a certain particular topic right obviously like well maybe not you Wes because you're like such a student of it like I, th I feel like you just know so much about you know not just cameras in general and angles but lighting and um and using film and uh and you know ang like like how to pull something out of a out of an actor and acting yourself like there you know all about every aspect and our student of film, which is why I think you're really good at finding those relationships and maintaining them. Mm. Not because you're, you you want to just, you know, oh, I can use them later, but because you want to learn more from them, right? You yeah. want to have that knowledge so that you can communicate with them if and when you start working with them, right? If you know a particular gaffer, you know, there's a way you talk to a gaffer uh, or a grip that, that is different than a DP, and there's a way that you talk to a DP that's different than a producer, right? And and knowing that because you know them and have worked with them in the past or you've just been around them or your friends is uh, is super important. So, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question or is that long-winded? No, I think there's some nice gems in there, though. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, the it's hard to build a career doing what you love. Um, and I think ultimately, yeah, you do. I like what, I really like what you said, do what you're excellent at to the best of your ability. And if you have no other option, pay people who are excellent at what they do and it's additive, it's all additive and it only makes you better. Um, at the end of the day, that's now obviously, and we were talking about this before the podcast, obviously if you can't do that, yeah, then you can't do that. Yeah. That's a moot point, you know? If you're trying to make, it, it's it's better to just make something than to be stagnant and not because you're just, you know, like waiting for this one guy or you are learning something and it's taking you forever. Like just do it, you know, and then um, if you don't have the money, but if you have the money, and a lot of times people have more, have more ability than what they think because they're afraid yeah. to throw money into something um, because they're afraid that it's going to, you know, not give them a return or something. And it's like, you know, how often do you go to Starbucks? 
How, mm. Like, really, how much money have you spent at Starbucks over the last year? You know, add that up. That's probably, I mean, that alone by itself is probably a good couple grand, I would imagine, <laughs> right. you know? So it, it's, there's, yeah. It's true. And just to double down on the point you just made a minute ago, which was like, don't not do something just because you know you don't have the pieces that you think you need like it it is better to be doing it than not doing it um and i think perfection is the greatest enemy right we're all afraid of getting it wrong or not nailing it to the perfection and it's never going to go the way you want right the the ira glass there's that gap that we're all working to to close um with what we see in our head versus what we actually end up creating. And it's a process closing that gap down. Um, and the only way you're ever going to do it is by doing it, not by, you know, waiting for this perfect day. That'll never come. I've seen so many people, you know, waste away on the sidelines because they're afraid to get dirty and, and, and to embarrass themselves, right. That ultimately creating is a vulnerable, uh, endeavor. You're never going to nail it a hundred percent of the time. Like we're going to look at Captain America Civil War and I promise Joe and Anthony Russo are watching this film and saying, ah, I wish we had done X, Y, Z. I wish we'd changed the lighting on his face in that scene just a little bit, you know, um, to, to clean up the, the, the composite or whatever. Like there's always going to be something better that you could Mm -hmm. have done. Um, and don't let that, don't let the enemy of your progress be this goal of perfection. Um, embrace it. Embrace the lack of uh, perfection and and grow. You know, that's that's the hardest thing is to make that leap, I think. Yeah. Agree. I mean, I follow a guy, and I don't know why I still follow him, but I follow a guy on Instagram who's, he's a really, he's a really good uh, engineer, mixer, producer. Um, and I just follow him because I, I, he's, he gives a lot of information, a lot of tips and stuff but he is just adamant about hire somebody for this and hire somebody for that. And I think he's right to Mm. a point, but you know, like he's just very aggressive on like you, you know, it'll take you 10 years, 20 years to get as good as me at mixing. So why would you try to do it? It, There's no way. And he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that he's not wrong when he says that, but at the same time, if I, if I'm struggling to put food on the table for myself or for my family, the last thing I'm going to do is worry about the, in the, uh, the micro gains, or I guess maybe even macro gains that I would get from hiring somebody for, you know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars a song to mix something when, when I'm struggling to, you know, like put food on the table. So it, it really is a, a circumstantial thing, but you know, I have that knowledge of knowing of, of knowing and making the decision of spending the money to hire someone to get those micro gains or even macro gains, or to say, you know what, I can't do that right now. Yeah. So I'm just going to make this and I'm going to make it as best as I can. And then that's going to be what it is. And then I'm going to go make the next thing. And maybe at that time, I'll be able to have the money to go do it. Now, yeah, I'm not going to lie to myself, you know, at the same time, yeah, I need to cut out Starbucks. I need to cut out, you know, like like all the streaming service, you know, <laughs> services that I s- assign to. I mean, I'm not going to, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things that you spend money on you don't even realize. Hmm. And and because it's $4 here, $6 there, $10 there, and then it adds up. Um and so it it all it also comes down to planning. So, anyway, I I subscribe to both, but I think yeah. they're very circumstantial. I think you're right. And micro gains are nice, but sometimes all you need is 85% of the way there. And totally that extra 15% is, is the ROI there for you. Um, and if it is, then yeah, cut out those things, man. Over the last 10 years, I promise eight to nine of those. I lived very, every dollar that I spent was either I needed to spend it to live or it went into my production company. Like, yeah. That was a dollar that went towards a lens that went to a new camera or whatever, like a new light. Every single dollar that I could spend on my production company was a tax deductible dollar. (laughs) And that would also, you know, help me get to where I was trying to be. And so intentionality, man. uh, And you wouldn't have it any other way, I'll bet. Nope. You know, because that how good did that feel to then go buy that lens? Yeah. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or then go buy that 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 new computer, you know, to to edit with because you're old and die. Right. Or no. And it feels so good. Feels great. Don't get me wrong. It's been really nice to finally be like. I have patio furniture now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when you can't, you know, it's, it's, it's okay yeah. to, to, you know, I've got focused. a, I've, I've got a frame under my bed now <laughs> instead of it being on the floor. Yeah, I get it. Nice. Oh man. Oh, so yeah. What are we, what are we looking at today, man? Yeah, it's going to be a good one. So today we're covering um, a request, uh, Captain America Civil War. So if you haven't seen it, please go pause this and watch the entirety of the MCU uh, <laughs> because we're going to ruin a bunch of stuff, pretty much the entire thing. Yeah, it's, oh, it's yeah. hard to discuss one of these fragments without adding a little context here and there. Um, for, for what it all means but we'll look at a few things we'll look at some of the story and writing the structure of the film as well as ramping up tension with precision uh, we'll look at a little bit of the directing um delivering a meaningful line and setting up a monologue and other such stuff and things and stuff in a quick synopsis of the film political involvement in the avengers affairs causes a rift between captain america and iron man it's directed by joe and anthony russo Screenplay by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Cinematography by Trent Opalock. Um, starring Chris Evans as Captain America, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, Sebastian Stan as Bucky, Anthony Mackie as Falcon, Chadwick Boseman as Black Panther, Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda, and Daniel Bruhl as Zemo. You should have seen his little face. Just try, okay? I'm going to bed. I love you. I almost killed the wrong man. Hardly an innocent one. This is all you wanted. To see them rip each other apart. My father lived outside the city. I thought we would be safe there. My son was excited. He could see the Iron Man from the car window. I told my wife, don't worry. They're fighting in the city. We're miles from harm. And the dust cleared. And the screaming stopped. It took me two days until I found their bodies. And my father, still holding my wife and son in his arms, And the Avengers, they went home. I knew I couldn't kill them. More powerful men than me have tried. But if I could get them to kill each other, I'm sorry about your father. He seemed a good man with a dutiful son. Vengeance has consumed you. It's consuming them. I'm done letting it consume me. So I know we kind of already broke down some of this inadvertently while we were discussing uh, Doctor Strange. Um, right. But even within that, like, uh, how does this stack up in the greater Marvel universe. Um, like one, does it still land even out of context? I know you went through recently and watched it all, but now you just kind of went back and randomly watched this in the apropos of nothing. Right. And so yeah. I'm, I'm curious if it still plays well on it as, as a standalone. Um, yeah. Um, I, it's, it's really hard for it to be standalone hmm. um, for me because it's so much of it is based off of off of Ultron and knowing when when you're trying to pit two superheroes against each other cap and and iron man i i, I kind of need a little bit more backstory as to why they're so differing you know in their in their you know, opinions and and they do a, a really all the all that they can to make this as standalone as they possibly can. 
You know, um, I mean, they talk about Sokovia all the time. They, uh, in it, they bring it up a lot. Um, obviously in that, you know, scene there, there's a lot of backstory. Um, but things like being reminded and maybe they, they do at a moment in here and I just missed it, but being reminded that, that Ultron only happened because of Tony. Right. Yeah. And, and they, they don't actually bring it up they, in this film. Okay. Good. Okay. No. Good. So that's the biggest thing that I think that they missed here is just remind because, because Tony is so adamant about there being, um, there being checks and balances and you're sitting there thinking, well, why the hell would he, you know, I know he has guilt. Be, he, he might feel guilt because Sokovia killed a lot of people and they couldn't save everybody. And that's what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, he couldn't save everybody. So that's what the guilt is. No, the guilt is that the only reason it happened in the first hand place is because he built Ultron and they never remind you of that. Mm-hmm. And um, so for it to be standalone, I think that ha- that needed a little bit more um, focus, you know, for Tony. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a good moment where the mother walks out, you know, like, a, like tells Tony, you know, he, sh- he should be ashamed or whatever, like gives him all this guilt and shows him a picture of her son who died. And, and that was really riveting. Um, and, and gives a good base as to why, as to why he might feel some guilt, but it doesn't connect it to him building Ultron in the first place. So that would have been good for them to tie that in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that being said, I will say that there is a lot that co- that this movie covers. It is very detailed and very deep. And if you blink, you miss a lot. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of dialogue is really important. Um, stuff when nothing is happening is just as important as stuff when it is happening. In fact, more so in a lot of cases. All these conversations between not just Tony and, and Cap, but, you know, I uh, would say uh, Hawkeye and... Um, uh, uh, Natasha, Black Widow. Yeah, and, and yeah. Natasha. Yeah, you know, because they're best friends, mm-hmm. and and it's very difficult for them to reconcile. You know these things. So, um, I thought they did an amazing job every other way. Yeah. That would be the only thing that would mm-hmm. make it more standalone, which is what you asked in the first place. For yeah. me, you know, mm-hmm. it's like let's hit home that the whole this is all Tony's fault, all of it you know, let's really drill that down so that when he comes, comes out and is in support, support of the accords, you're, you're like, I get why I get why. Cause I need to be railed in me as Iron Man. I need to be held accountable, you know, and, and, and railed in. And if I can do this and I'm not, I don't even have any real superpowers. Imagine what Cap could do, you know, imagine what, whatever, you know, internally he's thinking mm-hmm. that, right? He obviously thinks he's the strongest Avenger, you know, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, so anyway, so that's what I'd say for that. Um, and then I also, like, I, I thought that that it was a really uh, timely and important statement, whether they meant it or not, about Democrat versus Republican, about conservative versus liberal, and how we can look at this and not think anything about actual politics and just think, God, why can't they just get along? Hmm. Why can't they figure it out? I see both sides. Cause I kind of hmm. do. I, I like, what if there's a bad superhero, you know, or like a superhero with an, with an alternate agenda that's still seemingly good and doing a bunch of stuff that you can't control, right? You need some kind of checks and balance, but, but at the same time, they've got to take action really quickly. So I see both sides. Why can't that happen in real life? You know? Or even even worse, like what if the people that you give power um, misuse it, right? And now they want exactly. you to go and uh, use your incredible powers against someone that you don't think deserve it. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, let, let's Star Wars, right? Like yeah. the Empire was <laughs> not always bad, you know, yeah. like or like had a had and their agenda changed and like you know whatever. So um, anyway, that. I thought that that was a really interesting and, and, and strong layer that, that hit for me, you know, as well, Mm. because I, because I was able to see both sides. They did a really good job of hitting beats and hitting moments, you know, um, at the end, oh my gosh, the fight between Cap and Iron Man at the end was so epic, man. What a great scene with the light behind them coming through those, those pillars and, and it just so, so strong. And then it set up really, really great when Tony finds out, you know, um, uh, that cap knew 
about his father being killed and, and didn't say anything. And, um, and then I loved the scene you played too, because, uh, uh, Zemo, like, he's just a dude. He's just a regular dude. And he, but he understood that you can't defeat them physically, but you can cut them down internally. And it's the same thing that I feel like happens in this country all the time. Hmm. Maybe Russia's doing it. Maybe, maybe we're doing it to ourselves. Who knows? The blame could come from anywhere, but we're doing it. Yeah. You know, we sit there and I fight with my father about, about, you know, um, uh, uh, Trump, you know, or I'll fight with my cousin about AR-15s. But at the same time, you know, I'm alienating myself from my family at the same time as trying to fight, you know, what, for what I think is right. You know, I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting my, my family for not having relationships with some people in my family because of that. And I think that's, this speaks to that so well. It's just, just, it's a really strong movie and it's fun too. you know, Ant-Man growing 80 feet tall and (laughs) and Spider-Man swinging in, you know, like it was just really, uh, yeah, it's a great, great, great film. Yeah, they do a they really do an incredible job like of maximizing the runtime. Like cuz it's two and a half hours almost, you know, 227 whatever minus credits, probably 220 um give or take. And that's really well utilized cuz you're right, there is a ton of story. They cover so much and it's all useful when you're discussing the topic of a civil war, right? It's all about internal strife. Um, and if you're going to have internal strife, you need to have internal politics. Uh, and so they take all these moments to, oh, we're going to transition whatever cap uh, to another country. Let's cut away and let's go talk to Wanda and Vision. And let's just sit and watch them cook and let's see what develops. Um, and they have these conversations about how they see themselves versus how society sees them. Um, and what does that mean to them? Uh, and you just watch this little moment build and then we're done and we're out. Um, but now that little three and a half minute scene, you know, adds needed context and needed emotional stakes so that when we see them fight later on, it actually means something. It's not just, Oh, these two people are fighting and I thought they were on the same side instead. No, these are two people with similar worldviews. Um, but slightly different agendas and slightly different things um, because they, they emotionally have the same problem, which is they have an incredible amount of power that terrifies the world um, and how they go about trying to reconcile that as two completely different paths. And so it's, there's some nice symmetry uh, that they are able to place across, you know, the, the dividing line, right? vision that towards the end of the film, um, at the, uh, the airport, he literally draws a line in the, in the pavement. Yeah. And it's, it's subtle, um, and in some ways overt, like, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, okay, we're here and y'all are there. And it's, you know, uh, Hawkeye versus Nat. Um, and they both have these similarities between them in a close relationship. And so finding little ways to flesh out these characters builds so m- so well into this idea of uh, civil war and what it means to have infighting, um, let alone you get into Tony and Steve, right? <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah. That's where all the heavy punches land. And it, oh, man, yeah, I'm just really, this is probably my second favorite of the Marvel series. Like, um, Infinity Behind. War. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's One nothing. of the best moments I've God. ever had in a theater was the end of that movie with you. That was... Agreed. I, I mean, and I'm talking, I've seen Interstellar, you know, four or five times in the theater with you uh, once or twice. And and still, that it, end, my jaw has never been on the floor so much. So anyway, yeah. Takes the breath out. But yeah. this to me is a close second because they... It's not just an action film. And I think that's one of the things that I really love about this film is we don't have a too many of these NPCs, right? These non-playable characters running around just for the purpose of getting their ass handed to them, right? We open with these masked soldiers who are fodder. They're just there to get their ass whipped um, by our heroes. Uh, but we kind of move away from that. Like they're there at the beginning and then... 
90% of the rest of the film is not that it's, you know, I think there's one other section where we have more masked, you know, soldiers getting their butt kicked, but, uh, otherwise, you know, it's really just our guys fighting each other, which is so much more satisfying to me. Um, because I always get really frustrated. It doesn't matter what franchise it is when I just see a body count for the sake of having a body count. Um, I, it's not that I mind having a body count. It's it, it, the peril is never real. I never feel like there's ever any actual danger. This is just eye candy. Um, and I'm resistant, I guess, on a psychological level uh, to that stuff because I I want to see the stakes. I want to see yeah. the stuff that matters. Can I say, because it's because numbers, the bigger they are, have less meaning. Yes. Yeah. You can, when you say $1,000, that's a lot of money. If you say a billion dollars, there's no way your brain can comprehend that. You know, a million, it, you can't even really comprehend. You think you can comprehend it, but you really can't. And so when you talk about like a body count, if there's 30 people, none of them matter. Yeah. If there's one person and that person lasts an hour that then and then dies, then that one person has way more weight than a hundred, a thousand people, right? In a film. So anyway, yeah, I exactly. totally get that. I totally really get well that. said. And so watching this, I, I'm, I'm so much more interested in the drama unfolding. I love that little moment where uh, Wanda calls out uh, Hawkeyes, you're pulling your punches. Like we we're doing something here, man. <laughs> Stop it. You know, it doesn't matter that she's your friend. One, uh, if you, if you, don't stop pulling your punches. She's going to whip your ass. Um, and so don't take that for granted because she was about to when Wanda stepped in, <laughs> yes. you know? And so he, I love those little checks because we're also thinking as an audience, like how far are y'all going to take this? Um, and so it just kind of steadily keeps slowly ramping up. Like, well, if you're going to hit that hard, I got to hit this hard. If you're going to hit that hard then I got to hit this hard. Right. And now I got to be 80 feet tall and throw you into a plane. <laughs> like yes. this is, it's a, it's a arms race is what's happening, um, which I think is embedded really nicely into the film in these fairly subtle ways. Um, for one, you know, Tony has this off comment about how they don't grant whatever passports to nuclear weapons. Right. And he's talking about Wanda um, and he's referring to her as a nuclear weapon or a weapon of mass destruction. Um, and then the, the, the end of the film is, taking place in a nuclear silo. And so we are invoking not just all these very tense, you know, historical uh, elements, but also kind of comparing our, our superheroes to nuclear weapons and that there is an arms race and there's a limited amount of chaos you can allow in the world with that kind of power. Um, and they're having a really important discussion of how do we check our power? And I love it I, because it's not a simple question um, and therefore there shouldn't be a simple answer and there never is. Uh, and as much as I agree more with Cap, I'm, I love that moment that you talked about when Tony stops at the end and he realizes and he looks at, you know, Steve and he says, did you know? Because he's been lying to him this whole time. Cap is over here on the side of, you know, honesty and righteousness and, you know, doing the responsible thing for ourselves. Like we're the ones who need to be responsible for ourselves. We need to take responsibility. And yet he never took responsibility for the knowledge that he had and how it would impact one of his friends. What a great, beautiful, there's all kinds of internal conflict. It's not just, I disagree with you, but it's, I'm a hypocrite on so many other levels. And that's humanity. And that's why this is such a good movie. It's just a yeah. bunch of human beings. <laughs> they take all these moments, man. They it, It's so well written. This is a very hard movie to write. I mean, I, I just sit, I just sit there and I'm, I'm like, I'm watching it and all this dialogue is going back and forth. And I'm thinking, God, that one scene I just watched, that's five minutes long. That was amazing um, exposition without feeling like exposition. That was amazing. Like, like, artistry to move from from like a, a person's to explain explain a person's thought process and belief um and move that from one place to another um and push the narrative forward without feeling fluffy you know or whatever and then 
And then, yeah, at, at the end, I'm feeling torn between both sides. They're going to tell a little bit. They're going to make you be on Cap side. Then they're going to make you be a little bit more on Iron Man side. And because they're going to speak to, to reason and logic. Mm. And when, it's so funny. When we watch a movie, we see reason and logic. <laughs> but in reality, we don't. In reality, we see what we think we believe, mm. what we think that we're, that, that it, what we think is true and what we've known to be true our entire lives. So we're so much more susceptible in films. That's why films are so, so strong, so powerful, because they can convince you of something that you don't really believe. Yeah. That you don't think you believe, or they can expose what you actually do believe, but then you go back out in the world and you're like, no, 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 no. I think that AR-15 should be a open carry on, uh, on, you know, on campus or, you know, no, 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 no. I think that abortion should be illegal or no, I think it should be illegal. But then if you watch a film that makes you think about it, you're not, you're not bringing your, your worldly view in, you're just absorbing. And it's so, it's so powerful. I think they do such a great job at that, man. Yeah. It's, it's really impressive. Um, and with that, like I'm, I'm really impressed with just the structure of this thing um, because almost every scene builds and reveals something and it, it's propelling us forward and, and really simple ways, right? We have this cold open on the winter soldier being activated and used. Um, and then we kind of cut to whatever the, uh, the title scene, right? The, uh, Marvel logo thing. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, I love cold opens like that because it feels like a freebie. It's yes. a freebie for the, the filmmaker to insert a scene that doesn't like take a toll on the, on the viewer. Um, and it's, it's really hard to, tell this much story without feeling like dragged down by it as a, as a viewer, right. That I'm having to remember all this, like what happened back there. And so you have to be very careful about how you dole that out and how you build and how uh, you, you stretch so much story in a way that doesn't feel like uh, homework, you know, for the audience. That's a great point. What is it like seven? How many minutes is it until the actual title yeah. sequence and like it, and i mean they maybe take yeah four and a half five minutes so. okay well that's five minutes off the runtime you yeah. would say right because yeah. it's a little free you know thing at the beginning i've never looked at it like that yeah. a little free thing at the beginning and then the movie starts after it says civil war yeah okay yeah that's now it awesome. feels like you know this this prologue uh that you just always knew it was it's, yes. i've always known about this right it, just, it doesn't feel yes. like you had to sit through a thing um, because now you have the music and it's almost like a trailer but the, before the movie, right? You don't dwell on the trailers before your film. Um, and so it's genius. I love, you know, good use of a cold open. Um, and then we immediately go to cap and the team on a mission, right? And, uh, results in tragedy. And what I like, and I'm going to slightly disagree with what you were saying about this being a standalone movie. And I think you're right that they did everything they possibly could to make this a standalone film. Um, which was they didn't rely on a Sokovia flashback, right? They created instead a fresh, emotionally charged tragedy and they made Wanda responsible. And it would have been easier and quicker to whatever open on. And I feel like this is what DC would have done. They would have opened on like old footage of the oh, Sokovia yeah. disaster, right? And now we're just kind of living in, oh man, how that happened? Oh, that, that was really bad. But there's no emotional engagement with that. Instead, here we build a whole new moment where we're seeing them kicking ass, right? And we're we're watching them uh, prevent a biological weapon from being released, and we see you know a crowd of people about to get detonated along with Cap, and Wanda does the thing that she can do, right? She she prevents that and she throws it into the air, and then it just destroys this building. And you immediately, the music, the exciting music cuts out. Instead, we hear the, the, the crowd gasp and we see Cap reacting. Uh, we see the, the crowd disperse and everyone's running and he's calling for help. And now we just settle on Wanda's reaction like, oh, what did I just do? Boom. Now we have a really strong emotional punch that is going to propel the rest of the story forward. Because from here on out, Everything that happens is because of that one mistake. She made one small mistake and it cost whatever, you know, 20 people their lives. Um, but it's enough to 
build on top of. Now we can reference Sokovia, but we're not relying on someone who's just walking in off the street and said, what's a Marvel thing? Like, oh, that's the heroes, right? Or they, they can sit in it and they can hear reference to the Sokovia stuff um, and still get a punch because now we're going to go see Tony from this tragedy. We go and watch Tony react to his role and this mother's loss. And we see him now started to wrestle with this thing. And so now we have two big emotional punches um, that doesn't rely on you knowing exactly what happened in Avengers 2, Age of Ultron. Um, even though uh, it helps, like all that extra context is really nice. Cause, so we sit down into the debate when the whole team is there debating, do we sign these accords? And it's so good because they're not heavily relying on the past films and for you to be intimately just fresh, right? Coming off that stuff. But if you are, they do add so much more context and it's a, it makes it a better viewing for sure. And I absolutely agree with that, right? Even if you're bringing in Iron Man 3, where, which they reference, they lightly reference what happened between him and Pepper Potts uh, with Iron Man 3, right? Where Tony faced his personal life being destroyed through being Iron Man and his addiction to it. Um, and of course, the results of his overconfidence in building Ultron with Age of Ultron. Um, and so now with that stuff in mind, you can see why he's looking to alleviate his guilt, but also reduce his responsibility. Like that knowledge really does make this a richer film. Um, and same thing with Cap, like coming off of Winter Soldier, we saw Cap, you know, destroy uh, a government overreach that was, you know, going to result in a perversion, right, F through this evil force. Uh, with good intentions, they created this all-seeing shield eye thing uh, that could kill anybody in an instant. And instead, it got co-opted by, you know, an evil power. That's stuff that really happens. And that's why you need to be careful with, you know, the the tools that you use in so many ways. Um, government overreach is a real thing. And I love that they dance around it without turning it political. Like you said, like there's all kinds of ideas you could apply this stuff to. Uh, and I'm so grateful that they didn't. You could still enjoy this mm -hmm. film on its merits while still pulling out all kinds of interesting, you know, uh, contextual, relevant, topical stuff. Um, and so they don't heavily rely on it. Um, but we don't dwell on any of that stuff uh, in order to push the movie forward. Instead, we introduce one tragedy that really carries the film on its own. Um, and then they have a solid debate that really fleshes out the problem. And I love that. This film really lives on its own merit while still serving the overall arcs perfectly. So that if you are a fan, you're going to get so much more out of this movie. Um, but you can still bring in you know, your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend who doesn't care for Marvel films. And they're still going to have a good time um, because it's all there for them to be emotionally drawn. Um, and that debate is so good. Each character has their perspective. Um, and they, in very quick one to two sentences, you know, draw their line in the sand and why they're standing on that side of the line. And they reinforce it throughout the film. Um, and it's so tough, man. There are tons of characters. And to have a proper civil war, you really need that internal struggle and to give them all space without dragging out the runtime. And so almost every character has that emotional beat, you know, to, to heighten the conflict. Um, you know, and uh, even Zemo, um, right. We even see glimpses of him and we're checking the voicemail. Right. And we're like, what the heck is he doing? He has a loving wife and he's out here, running the streets, bro, well, come on, <laughs> you know, what, what's, what's, what the heck is he doing this for? Um, and it's building to this really lovely reveal at the end. And I love that monologue. Um, I think this is a really nice directing moment, uh, because it's set up in the chamber when he reveals that he's killed all the super soldiers. And personally, I love seeing them with the bullet in their head because it's a nice reminder that, they're super strong, but they're, they're still human. They can still, a bullet will still kill these guys. Um, and he has this very short conversation with Cap. And he's, Cap is trying to figure out why are you doing this? And I think he even has some point blank, like, 
what is this for? Um, and he's like, I want to see you, you know, torn apart or whatever. And he's, uh, he asks him, you lost someone. And we push in and he says, I lost everyone. And that's it for his backstory, for his motivation. We've been waiting. We've been trying to put together all these little pieces and it's just one simple, intimate, not over delivered line that kind of sets it into our mind. And I love this setup because it's locked off shots. We're going to do a locked off shot of him, a reverse shot of cap. And then we really feel the dolly move and, the, and, and we feel the importance of what he's saying. Um, when we just push in just very slow, subtle, and then he delivers his line. So he doesn't need to say a lot. The emotion is already there in the pause. It's in the camera movement and the simple line. I lost everyone. He doesn't even hit it, right? He just says it. Uh, it's it's relying on a total team coming together uh, and delivering, creating space um, for this thing to really land because it sets up the monologue with Black Panther perfectly. Now we're really waiting to hear, wait, he, but he was listening to a voicemail and now we cut in to them outside. We cut away from the fight sequence. Uh, between the three of those guys, uh, uh, Cap and Bucky and, and Iron Man. And we cut to him outside as Black Panther is sneaking up on him. We hear the voicemail again. It's the same voicemail. Now you're realizing, oh, God, he's just been re-listening to the same voicemail. Boom. Now we're starting to piece it together. And then T'Challa sets up the monologue for him. They don't just drop it in. It's not just listens to a voicemail, sees T'Challa goes straight into a monologue. Instead, uh, they let us ramp up to it a little bit, right? He's Here's T'Challa, and he's like, you almost had me kill the wrong man. He's like, it's not exactly innocent. Um, and then he goes into his monologue. Let me explain why I am what I am. Um, and, and you'll understand because you're a dutiful son, and you're here to do the same thing that I was here to do. And then he turns, and it's so beautiful because it's, He's the only one in this whole movie who steps back and says, ah, I see what's happening. Not me. Ooh. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you feel with that? The whole section, like it's not overly And his monologue is great, right? It's, it's simple. It's distilled to the core of what he's feeling. It's not overly explanatory. Um, there's a lot happening in between the lines that he's saying. Um, yeah. I thought it, I thought it's brilliantly delivered and directed to your point, you know, not over the top. And it's very much one of the things that makes this movie so good is that all the characters do what you would think the characters would do. They would be how, how they would normally be. You, and, and they do a great job of establishing that. And I think that, that, uh, Zemo's character is, he's not this grand, you know, like this massive evil villain. Right. And, one of the things that's one of the reasons why MCU is so good to me. It's so much better than than DC to me because the villains are relatable. Uh -oh. The villains, like, you, as as bad as they are, and as much as you want to see the good guys win, you know, if you step back and you were honest with yourself, you could identify with the with the desire of Zemo. You could identify with. Thanos. You could identify with uh, not all of them. Uh, some of them are just, you know, you want to see the world burn for no reason. Yeah. But, but him especially, even more than Thanos, because he's just a regular guy. And he, and the way that he delivers those lines is just, it's so matter of fact, it's like, it's part of him. It's like, it's been, it's burned into his, his being. And so it's just, uh, it's just words. It's just a conversation. It's just like, I'm, I'm spilling who I am to you right now. And there's no going back. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not flashy because I can't be because you'll win. You know, I'm doing it this way. Cause it's all I've got left, you know, because you've taken everything else from me. You've taken who I was, you know, and, and it's just so well written, so well shot, right. That I feel like I'm there and I, and he's talking to me and he's explaining to me as a viewer, you know, where he's coming from and and why and it's it's I, yeah I totally agree I love that scene God, it works. it's amazing and and T'Challa to to realize that and to see it and not just ignore it because oh no that's the bad guy 
which typically mm. is what happens 99% <laughs> of the time, right? So for that to, to actually, for them to allow that to happen, the writers to allow that to happen and to, and to, to give that to his character bolsters his character even more, you know, uh, so that when he has his movies, we know exactly what he's about, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. I loved, I really loved T'Challa in this. Um, Cause this is our introduction to him as a character and he's just awesome. Like he has no witty banter. Like it's not that he doesn't make you laugh. There's that moment on the, the on the, the airplane, you know, tarmac where Clint is like, we haven't met yet. I'm Clint. He says, I don't care. <laughs> then they start fighting. It's so good. Uh, but he, he's not there for witty banner. Um, and he's just kingly and his poise and his focused termination. Right. And it's all reflected right there in his dialogue, his physicality. He's very direct in his movement and he's unafraid. Right. Those bullets get shot at him, at him on the rooftop he doesn't dodge. He just turns. He, he, they're barely even curiosities. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's just a great, his character is just a really incredible contrast to all the other characters in this film. His less quote unquote really pops out. It really stands out um, because it's just a really well-built character and obviously a, a fantastic performance from Chadwick Boseman. Um, yeah. I love what he brings to this, everything, all of it. hundred percent. I love um, two. Ah, okay. Uh, last directing note, and then I'll move into a final couple of things. Um, the, I love the reveal. I think it's a really great reveal of the decimated arm, right? Iron Man blows this guy's arm off. Um, and the reveal is he falls back and we start low and slowly boom up as Bucky understands uh, his arm his arm is gone and we're revealing it as he's understanding that he no longer has an arm. Um, and I love it. It's, it's revealed as he discovers it. And so we're experiencing it through his perspective. And so the significant lands much cleaner and stronger than simply showing us that his arm is missing and watching him react to it. And instead we discover as he does, uh, for a much stronger emotional, you know, through line and it just lands on the audience so much better um the, by, by the way they they directed that scene that's really really fantastic work um and it's something that you it's obvious in hindsight um but i promise as a director those things are not always obvious sometimes you're just like oh his arm's gone let's let's show that no let's reveal it and let's reveal it in a way that enhances the character's experience um and help us identify with that and now we're like, oh, crap, his arm is gone. Um, he's out of this fight. Yeah. Um, that, that's. Can I make a point about what you said? That is a really great point about, in hindsight, it's easy to look at this and say things about it, have opinions and all that stuff. But keep in mind, this didn't exist. Right. <laughs> this wasn't anything but words on a page until Joe and Anthony actually directed it and had a vision for every single angle, every shot, every movement, all of those things. It's so easy to forget about that. You know, it's easy to forget, you know, that, that, uh, kid a didn't exist, you know, like until it did and some people made it right. It's just, it's unbelievable when you yeah. think about it from that pulling anyway. nothing into something. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's freaking cool. Um, there's another scene that I really, really love. It's brief, but I think it's brilliant, which is um, the apartment breach when Cap and Bucky are talking. Like the build up to that is so good. I love the tight, concise writing here. It's Cap says a line, Falcon voiceover, right? Uh, the radio we're hearing in his ear, uh, you know, five seconds out, you know, line, Falcon, line. We hear steps, line, breach, breach, breach. Boom, right? And it's just very punchy. Every moment adds or reveals something while ramping up tension. And I actually just want to listen to this. Like, just listen to the scene. It's tight. I mean, this is a 60, 70 second, you know, thing. Heads up, Cap. German special forces approaching from the south. Understood. You know me? 
You're Steve. I read about you in a museum. They've set the perimeter. I know you're nervous. And you have plenty of reason to be. But you're lying. I wasn't in Vienna. I don't do that anymore. They're entering the building. Well, the people who think you did are coming here now. And they're not planning on taking you alive. That's smart. Good strategy. They're on the roof. I'm compromised. This doesn't have to end in a fight, Buck. It always ends in a fight. Five seconds. You pulled me from the river. Why? I don't know. Three seconds. Yes, you do. Breach! Breach! what i mean just the audio alone is really here's it's the same thing that makes for a good monologue which is pacing pacing increases heights you know go up you can only do that if you start slow and we start the very top of that scene with cap getting information hey uh, they're, they're setting up a perimeter got it and then he takes like 10 almost 15 seconds of silence as now what are you doing you're wasting time uh and it's starting to create something in us but it what it's doing is it's giving space to create that contrast you can't have fast if you don't understand slow and so let give us some slow let us build into this thing and then it just slowly starts like a heartbeat speeding up boom 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 bang, bang, bang. And then just listening to that audio, you can start to feel the rhythm that they're creating. And it's great because they also got lots of coverage so that in post, we can still control the pacing. If we're not quite nailing it in the room that day, we can now revise it because we've gotten so much coverage of everything that we need. Um, we can tighten here and there or create space here and there to create the kind of uh, arc that we're looking to create within this scene. It's just flawless and they don't actually resolve it before they breach mm. do you notice that like he says why'd you pull me from the river referencing winter soldier i don't i don't know or something yes you do and then they breach so so it's it's almost like he's he's calling out you know me i know you know me come with me but bucky doesn't have a chance to say okay let's go they immediately have to start fighting together it's forcing them to fight together before the resolution has actually happened. So even when they're fighting, you're stressed out because you're thinking, is Bucky going to turn on Cap at any moment? He pro he he could. But anyway, yes, it's a brilliant, great, great point. point dude. Scene. No, yeah. I, I love that uh, because you're absolutely right. Not resolving it creates tension throughout the rest of the scene, but it also gives us something to look forward to. We have now... We now have a question that's unanswered that we need yes. an answer to, and we're yes. waiting for that answer. Um, and it's not going to come for another, you know, 10 minutes, whatever, 15 mm -hmm. minutes after they pull him out of the river. Same thing yep. that he did is now going to be done to him. And mm -hmm. now we have, you know, symmetry and reciprocity and we can build onto that. Um, yep. Yeah, great. And that's an 80 second scene. Like they did so much uh, with just a few lines of dialogue and implications. Yeah. Just very cool. Freaking genius. Great writing, great directing. Um, odds and ends. I, this is very much an odd and end. Uh, I love how the Secretary of State, Ross, uh, is a completely unlovable character. Like he's the worst. You just hate him. Um, and it's, it's very satisfying because we don't want to like that person who's running roughshod over our guys and seeing, and it's just this really unnatural feeling of watching Tony submit to a, an authority figure of that caliber like you just it all feels wrong um in the best way and so whenever they end up bucking that system that feels right because it never felt right in the first place um yeah i also love seeing humans getting their ass handed to them by bucky right tony gets one kick and he is out um, without a suit on right in the cafeteria fight scene um he gets whatever punched or kicked across the room kick punch uh across the room <laughs> and he's done he's out of the fight now like he had one brief moment with his iron watch um that 
transformed into a glove. Uh, and he had this really nice moment where he stops the bullet and he's like, whoa. And then he backhands uh, Bucky with his own weapon. Uh, and that's it. Good night. <laughs> yeah. Well done. And then same thing, like uh, Agent Carter gets one shot and she's out. Black Widow gets pummeled onto a table and she's out. And that's what happens when humans actually get hit with that kind of force. Like there's bones and there's lungs and there's organs and you're very soft tissued brain, like getting yeah. slammed into your skull. You're not meant for that kind of stuff. And so I really appreciate feeling that because it also nicely sets up a really good contrast with T'Challa because he is enhanced um, and seeing him take a punch and just go right back at it really enforces the fact that he can play in their league without his technology. He has a suit. He doesn't need his suit um, because he's he's on another level. He's he's toe to toe with these guys. Um, yeah. And I just I love that, you know, sequence because it, it's it's perfectly structured. Again, it goes back to the story structure um, in a way to deliver maximum impact. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, my last two things uh, is I love Tony emotionally out of control. It's a really fantastic contrast to his character oh, yeah. uh, that prides itself right on being snarky in order to create emotional distance from everyone and everything. Right. He doesn't take anything serious no matter what. He's, he's telling a joke, even in his other films, whenever we're at the apex of uh, the, the, the story. Right. And he's fighting the bad guy. He's still telling jokes. And here all that gets stripped away at the end when he finds out you did this. I don't care. He killed my mom. It's so good. It's so unhinged and it's just beautifully executed. Um, and it's only because his character is so consistently one way. And Robert Downey Jr. is just an, a world-class actor, obviously. Um, but to see him pull back that layer and just be raw is not something we ever get to see from Tony. And so it was really, really satisfying. Um, Great. And my last note is it's very simple and it's obvious, uh, but I love there's this great image at the end of his father's shield, Tony's father's shield stabbed into his chest by Cap. And it's so emblematic, right, of everything this movie has been talking about. Um, and then it's ripped out by Cap um, and it's like he's ripping out his heart um, and it's of course underscored with you don't deserve that shield right and he leaves it um yeah it's just a really strong visual image of the shield sticking out of his broken chest um yeah there's so much you can pull out of that but beautiful. so i have a question for you i love those points great points um i have my opinions but what, what why do you think this is captain america civil war and not avengers civil war i know because this does feel like an avengers film because um, there's so many of them in it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but ultimately, it's, I mean, it. it's a fair question, but I think the most simplistic version is because it involves so many of uh, Cap's, you know, cohorts. You have Falcon, you have Bucky, and them together are a unit, and that's ultimately Captain America. This is his story. But yeah, it could... It could have easily have been Avengers, you know, 2.5, <laughs> um, but without yeah. having Thor and Hulk, uh, you start to, it doesn't feel Avengers enough. And maybe that's what yeah. it is. It's not quite Avengery enough <laughs> to maybe. be an Avengers film. Yeah. 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 Maybe. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the, the best, the best reason I could go off of would be that the Avengers films, they're all, it, whether they're all there or not, they're fighting somebody else together. Mm. And in this case, they're fighting each other, really. They're all fighting somebody eventually, but they're like really fighting each other. And so maybe that was why, or maybe it was just time for another Captain America movie. <laughs> and so that's why they named it Captain America Civil War rather than another, another Avengers movie. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, mean, ha I the, really don't know. The other thing they could have named it would just be Marvel Civil War. Like, exactly. Um, exactly. But yeah, I think just labeling it Captain America uh, 
feels that'll better. get more people in the yeah. seats. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which is, I'm totally okay with like, I'm fine either way, <laughs> you know, whatever the reason is, but I was just curious <laughs> why you thought that. So, yeah. Um, so. nice. Any final thoughts? No. Um, I just wanted to thank Elise for this, uh, um, uh, recommendation. Uh, love it. Give me any reason to watch any, you know, of the Marvel movies again. Uh, and just like, just like her, if you guys have recommendations, we'd love to hear them. I, I, I absolutely adore this movie. I think it's Same. strong. Thanks, Elise. Um, yeah. So what are you going to recommend this week? Oh, uh, okay. So I, I've kind of fought watching it for a long time or for a while now, but I t- just decided to, to dive in and I, I really like, I really like the show um, because I was so frustrated with it half the time. But I'm going to recommend Banner of Heaven on Hulu. Um, under the, banner, under of the banner of Heaven, yeah, on Hulu. I, I, it's definitely not a movie that, or a show that you can just binge uh, because it's very long. Like all the episodes are super long. Oh. But I, I found that I have this love for Andrew Garfield that that I didn't really realize before. Um, and, and this show really hits at home. I just, he is amazing in this film because he's got to play a very specific dude and mm-hmm. it's such great casting to cast him. And I mean, there are a few scenes and a few lines where I'm like, Oh, that was whatever, yeah. you know, but not from him, always right. from somebody else. Yeah. But the, but all the acting pretty much everywhere is top notch. The writing is really great. The cinematography is amazing. The concept is heavy af um yeah and i am totally shocked you watched this like i wasn't gonna recommend it you know because of i know things but yeah yeah i know i know but there's not a whole lot shown in some cases and so it whatever that's what i'm gonna recommend i just finished it and uh and it's it's so such a wonderful show um really well done you just changed what I was going to recommend. Um, Ooh, I like it when that happens. <laughs> like, because I watched Under Under the Banner of Heaven because of Andrew Garfield, but also because it had Daisy Edgar Jones. And so I was just like yeah. two of my favorite people. Like when I discovered Andrew Garfield after uh, watching Never Let Me Go, I immediately went back and watched, you know, his the last film, which was uh, Boye, uh, and you should, I think you would enjoy it. It's a different film. It's a small little indie, um, but his performance is just fantastic. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to recommend another Daisy Edgar Jones, um, show, uh, which is called, Oh God, war of the worlds. Um, and it's on epics, <laughs> which <laughs> For all of you that have epics. That's right. <laughs> Which I know you do. Oh, uh, um, I am. Yeah, I think uh, I share my, it's funny. I have my own Amazon Prime account, but uh, my friend Joanna sometimes likes to make me watch shows that she's watching. And so on my uh, streaming device, on my TV, I'm logged into her um, uh-huh. uh, Amazon Prime so that I can watch whatever she wants me to watch sometimes. Uh, but she was like, Hey, I'm getting epics. If, if you want to watch anything for the next month, they have a show. And so I was like, all right, I'll see what they got going on. War of the worlds. Oh, I'll check that out. It's got Daisy Edgar Jones. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm in. Um, it's, it's an intense film. I will say, um, there are films that like that, that kill kids. Um, and we've covered a lot of them (laughs) to be fair, but, all the ones that we've ever covered, they've always felt necessary for the story. Like m- the way I think we gauge whether or not it makes sense is if the kid didn't die, does the story fall apart? Can this story exist without killing off this kid? Um, and if no, then you have to kill the kid. Um, but if yes, don't kill the kid. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. No, you might just be trying to torture your audience uh, for without a really good payoff. Um, And so I will say War of the Worlds is one of those that kills a lot of kids that don't actually need to be killed. (laughs) I would argue, and maybe their, their creators would, you know, disagree, but um, I would, I can't imagine the story doesn't work exactly as is without brutally murdering some of these kids. Um, Mm. Yeah. So, but if that isn't a problem for you, then 
plug in and watch because it's surprisingly it, it it's reminiscent of like invasion um okay on apple and so it's got some nice pacing it's got gabriel Byrne, um but more importantly it's got daisy edgar jones and so yes. yeah uh yeah i was first introduced to her uh normal people which blew my mind so which we've talked about on the yeah i was talking about it last night with joanna my friend joanna oh because you were probably talking about the show no actually it World really Worlds? randomly popped up actually um, oh it just, just happened to talk about the, okay. no, yeah normal normal people um yeah. oh i think it was because i was talking about experiences that i had watching a film and how i want to create these mm. experiences because it's it's this universal feeling that you get while watching that show and yet everything in there is incredibly specific it's in another country um and another culture that i'm not familiar with uh, and yet it just kills everyone that watches it it really yeah. decimates you um and in a, a beautiful way yeah we've we've touched on that on a bonus episode uh, i think that was our first bonus episode oh. um yeah so anyway i fell in love with her performance um in that show and now i watch anything with her name on it All um right. yeah cool and then andrew garfield same thing so I was, yeah. I was destined to watch you know under the man of heaven yeah yes yes yeah. so anyway um now that we've had this palate cleanser stay tuned for next week we finally get back into our asian cinema exploration with a light-hearted film called memories of murder i'm trying to warm todd up to old boy because you haven't seen old boy right i have you have seen but it. it was i have but it was a long time ago okay so okay. i need to see it again nice yeah. um well one way or another we're warming up to old boy for those maybe who haven't seen it because yeah uh, it's a watch that first step it's a doozy it's a doozy <laughs> um yeah so stay tuned for next week we're going to cover uh memories of murder and if you're enjoying the show subscribe drop us a review on apple Podcasts. i need to update this i keep saying itunes but i don't think there is an itunes any longer um so wherever you listen to your uh to our show your show um apple podcast wherever else you listen leave us a note a review if there's something you want us to to cover like todd said uh big thank you to elise um and we really appreciate you listening hopefully you enjoyed the show we'd love to hear uh your thoughts on civil war why you love it and why uh this was a a, a fun request for you um yeah so i'd love to hear what you have to say at least uh, and if you want to do that you can do that at the pestlepodcast.com slash captain america civil war and our quote of the day today is from the the great stan lee um just because you have superpowers that doesn't mean your love life would be perfect i don't think superpowers automatically means there won't be any personal personality problems family problems or even money problems I just tried to write characters who are human beings who also have superpowers. It's just so brilliant. What what an amazing dude. I mean, he's created so much for us and just out of nothing, you know? Um, but it's such a great way to write. That's why that's why I love Marvel so much because it's just that. It's yeah. like they're these are human beings even even though they're extraordinary they can only you know there's never perfect and he and exploiting that or showing that is super important that's i mean a lot of the reason why like you know social media is so toxic and stuff because you don't see that kind of st side to people you just see the beautiful parts so yeah anyway mm -hmm. great quote excelsior well said man yeah well thank you guys so much for joining us take that quote Take it with you, write something beautiful and make something beautiful. Um, like Wes said, please share us with your friends, Re recommend uh, a film or a show or something. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and uh, any kind of review or subscribe, that all helps. So thank you very much for listening. Until next week, I'm Todd. I am Wes. Go watch the movies. Is that coming out of you? <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of do it. <laughs> I don't know, it's like breathing.